Okay. We're here with Senator Bennett from Colorado, who is Scott's favorite senator, apparently. Is I'll he your favorite? That. Is That's he? right. So, right. so you need to start. Okay. So full disclosure, I was all in on Senator Bennett's presidential campaign, yeah. actually hosted a fundraiser. Yeah. Not very well noticed event in the history of America. Not politics, true. Huge influence. You, no, well, thank you for having me anyway. And thank you for paying attention to that campaign. My mom, uh, when I told her I was running, said to me, Michael, do we really need a seventh candidate in this race? Yeah. Something she's never said to Corey Booker wow. or anybody wow. else. It was what? pretty rough. Well, uh, let's kick it off there. So you, you've you've run a presidential campaign. What do you think is working about the Harris campaign? If you identified one or two key things that seem to be resonating, what's what, what are those things? I, I think the most important thing is that the American people are so ready to turn the page on a, a generation of American politicians, frankly, on both sides. And she's been able to capitalize on that. She's been able to capture that lightning in a bottle and um and that's so i'd say that one thing too it was an amazing moment to the for many reasons the moment that joe biden decided to abdicate the 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 race something no politician would ever do right, but no, that day giving up power giving up power ultimate power and ultimate power and actually when his guys came over to the democratic caucus to have a conversation about what should happen i said among other things we're asking you to have a conversation with Joe Biden that nobody has ever had with a president. We're asking Joe Biden to make a decision that no other president has ever made. That in and of itself was extraordinary. But then to see on that day just this organic upwelling of mm -hmm. support in the Democratic Party for the vice president for a variety of reasons. I think people thought, you know, we've taken long enough. We don't have a lot of time. We got to figure out who the right person is and just go with it. Um, that's another thing I think she's done very, very well is be there and 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 taken on the the top of this ticket with an elegance and with a grace that has served her and the Democratic Party. Extremely so well. so you had, had been somewhat outspoken. You kind of hedged your your what you were saying. You didn't Nancy Pelosi it. You didn't full Nancy Pelosi. It. I got more credit for what I said from Scott than I did. For yes, you, you did, yeah. because uh, you, were, you were you were you were being very. Stop uh, mincing my words. Oh, well, yeah, you minced. There's a lot of mincing happening. So talk about why you did it that way, because you essentially encouraged because him to leave. And Nancy was more explicit where she's like, we want him to make a decision, and it essentially was just not that decision he's made. Well, I think I, I appreciate the position that she took. Look, I was the first. You got a lot of flack. But. Yeah, yeah and, I, and, I, and I did say that I thought, I was the first senator to say that I thought we were going to lose in a landslide. Right. And that we had a moral choice as Democrats and, frankly, as Americans to take seriously that, that problem. Not, not a contingency, but the reality that... We were at risk of losing the presidency, the Senate, and the House. Obviously, it was up to Joe Biden to make the decision that he did. It wasn't up to me to make that decision in any way for him or, in my view, to advise him about it. But when I was asked what I had said privately in our caucus meeting I, on national TV, I, that's what I said, and that's what I believed. And now I think we have the chance to win the presidency, win the Senate, and win the House. So when you think about how it happened, the, 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 obviously Donald Trump's been thrown off by this, by not just Joe Biden, who he keeps talking about running and using words like coup and things like that. <laughs> uh, and it's funny. Yeah. Um, but but also having a trouble getting her, his, and I shouldn't say hands around her because he is a sexual harasser. So getting, um, you know, figuring out how to deal with her. He, she can't, he doesn't seem to be able to define her or respond to her in anything that's not offensive. I mean, he's made his whole pol political career, uh, for, such as it is, uh, by threatening to drag us to back deep into the past. That he is a he is a reactionary force in American politics, and I think he cannot confront uh, the the uh, a politics that's oriented toward the future, both in in who Kamala Harris is, but also in the policies that she's pursuing. And now in one second, he finds himself being the lone octogenarian in this race. Right. And that's not sitting very well for him, I think, uh, among he the He also American feels people. like the incumbent, and she, even though she is he the incumbent. He definitely does. He definitely does. Yeah. Yep. Scott. 
What message do you think that over the next two nights, if you were advising the Harris campaign, what message do you think they need to get out to voters? I think that um, that we need to express the unity in the Democratic Party and the excitement in the Democratic Party. That's on clear display. I've been to a number of these events, and it's rare to see this. Uh, and so I think that's very exciting. And I think it's really important for us to express that this is about America, not about the Democratic Party, that we want people to be involved in this unifying vision for what the future looks like, that we can put this politics of division behind us, I mean, that we can put a freaking stake in it and put it behind us, and that we can move off into the future, not because we have a monopoly on wisdom, but because, you know, we are we are convinced that we can build a better future for our kids and for our grandkids. I think if she's focused on the future, oriented to, toward the future, um, that's what the American people well, desperately want to see out of this policy. Do they desperately policy. want more details? Because it's such a short, which we think is a good thing, the short campaign is I not. I don't think she, they want more details. I think they want to understand her values. I think they want to understand- Values versus where, policy. Values versus policy, absolutely. And you're right, this is a blessing for America. I mean, it, we, we have a two-year presidential and Senate campaigns yeah. that serve no purpose at all. There are countries around the world where they get their elections done in 45 or 60 days. I think we're going to see the virtue of that in this mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit just about foreign policy, because we have so far, it's been pretty, so far the messaging has been really strong and aspirational, but it's been a bit short on details. What are your views on what do you think the campaign, there's been some question about um, uh, Vice President Harris's support or lack thereof of Israel. What do you think the complexion should be around the Middle East uh, for the Harris Walls campaign? I think, in terms of the Middle East, the complexion should be around, you know, how do we get to a day after where there's a chance for a two state solution? How do we get focused on that and get past the 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 horrendous period of Ameri of, of of world history that we're in today. So that's where I think she needs to be there. I'd say more broadly on foreign policy, you know, the the Biden Biden deserves huge credit, I think, for building the coalition around Ukraine. Yeah. You know, you and I have talked about this before. Yeah. Ukraine is not a fight for Ukraine. It's a fight for democracy. It's the purest expression of that fight that's happening in the world today. Joe Biden showed up for that fight and mobilized allies in Europe and throughout uh, Asia to, to c continue in that fight. He strengthened NATO as a result. And she's going to pick up right where he left off. Whereas Donald Trump, what's he going to do? Like go to the Kremlin on his hands and knees and say to Vladimir Putin, you can have what you want. Uh, in Ukraine and to say to the leader in North Korea, you can have what you want there. I mean, it is ridiculous. And, tr and Trump's positions are so absurd. They are completely outside the mainstream of what used to be before the Republican Party became a cult of personality, what used to be Republican politics. Well, he may not politics. have any real values, right, in that regard. In that regard. And I think the minute Except he leaves the money. stage, we're going to discover that um, that we might actually have a coherent foreign policy as Americans that's not partisan anymore, All like right. the so one we've got that today. That said, he could still win. It's very He close. definitely she could is win. He's caught up. He I, you know, I talked to David Axelrod this morning, and he was one of the first to call for Joe Biden, and I know Joe Biden called him a prick, but he did it, and also was among those people who thought we needed to move faster. Um, and he said, look, we can't, and the, the head of the Future Forward thing said, this is not as... The polls aren't as good as you think they are. There's a honeymoon period here that keeps going, actually. This is going to shoot that up more because it's going to be, you know, an exciting convention. But are you, what are you worry, most worried about? I'm most worried that we could lose. And we can't take anything for granted. We can't take anything for granted. We have learned with the election of Donald Trump that our democracy is much more vulnerable than we thought. I'm not one of these people who walks around all day long saying Donald Trump's a threat to our democracy, he's a threat to our democracy. I think he is, but I think he's a symptom of our problems. You and I have talked about this before. The problem we are facing and the real threat to our democracy is our lack of economic mobility, the massive income and wealth inequality that we have in this country, the fact that we've got a K-12 education system that the quality of which is defined entirely by the, the income of the parents of students. That is a freaking threat to our democracy, and we have to find ways of addressing that. You know, so our winning is not in any way assured here, 
So I think what we have to do is get out over the next 70 days and make sure we do yeah, win. How, and that, how then to win if that's the case? I think no, the, it's a good chance. A little better than 50-50, which, by the way, is extraordinary given where we were six yeah. weeks ago. And what we've got to do is just do the work in the swing states that um, of, of getting out our base in those states, which is going to be energized by what she's doing and who she is, and, uh, and getting a few of the unpersuaded people uh, to come over on our side. And I don't think this country wants to go back to Donald Trump. When you look at the poll, the latest polling in this race, you know, there's a lot of reason to see that it's close. I think that it's nuts that there are people that want to give him the benefit of the doubt on economics because he's just a big trickle down economics guy. But that's a debate we have to have between now and the election. I think it's going to be very hard for him to overcome his unfavorables. But we're going to have to show up and do the work. And people are excited, energized. My daughter's been knocking on doors, and she, I could not get her to do a single thing for my reelection campaign. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2020, it's called right. a teenager. You know yeah. what it's called exactly? Teenager, high school, COVID. You know, she she said to me, "You used, you used, you know, you exploited me when I was a little kid because you made those TV ads that to show that I you were a good family guy, and I'm on strike for that reason." She's been knocking on doors in Michigan. Um, even before even before the switch in the race because she knows what's at stake mm -hmm. and i think the american people now i think they believe that we have a chance to put donald trump in the rearview mirror forever mm -hmm. as long as we do the work right. so that's what we have to Scott, do Scott, last question so this is my official softball question so colorado has the economic might of thailand with one twelfth the population it feels fairly reasonable like did people work together not a lot of, it feels like you and the governor and the junior senator get along. Wait, what can the nation learn from Colorado and Colorado politics? When you think about what Donald Trump represents in terms of the corruption of our democracy, you think about all the places in the world that you guys know much better than I, where corruption is the norm and where Trump is saying, you know, you're a, basically a sucker if you don't believe that our private sector and our public sector are hopelessly corrupt. I say come to Colorado, a place where, you know, we believe in our democracy, the rule of law, and the, the fact that we can drive economic innovation in ways that uh, the rest of the world isn't doing. I mean, you know, in the end, given it, w even with all the income inequality that I talked about and all the, one of our biggest assets is the capitalist system that we have. We just have to have it work right for the American people. It can't just heap all its benefits to people at the very top. We have to harvest the benefits so, of so innovation and all that stuff. That's what we're trying to one do. One quick Colorado. final question. Speaking of at the top, a lot of tech bros, we've talked, you and I have been at your office yeah, talking yeah. about this. How Some of them, of course, are on the blue team, a lot of them, right? How do you feel about this sh right word shift with some of them? Obviously, they I'm not surprised at all. But look, there's some people over there who think they should succeed, secede, secede yeah. from the United States yes, of America, yes. that, that it, the valley is so smart that somehow, mm -hmm. you know, they, they can't be imposed upon in any way and they should just have their own fantasy land. Yeah. I would not surprised at all by that. What I believe, and this is, you know, I think changed since you and I talked about this in my office. We have a mental health epidemic in America as a result of the algorithms these guys have unleashed on the American people. And we need to have uh, voices in Washington that are willing to stand up to them mm -hmm. and have a negotiation on behalf of the American people. No one has had a negotiation with Mark Zuckerberg on our economics or on our privacy or on our data. And he is basically strip mining uh, our kids' bedrooms. And right. that's what's that that's got to come to an end. Well, Elon's being the villain now, so that's why Mark's getting out of getting out. Well, it's not just Mark and not just Elon. There are other people right. that are hiding behind them. And I think we've got to take this on. I mean, I have argued for a long time, in fact, since you and I were in the office together, that we need a new agency in Washington, just like Teddy Roosevelt had right. when he was dealing with the oil and gas trust. We need one that's dealing with these well, guys. Well, Scott and I will run it for you. That's yeah. Okay. You're hired. Yeah, that's yeah. You are hired. Yeah, and then you will go out in a large yeah, scandal, a large, that'll ugly work. scandal. Anyway, thank I you so much. Thank oh, you, Oh, I doubt. Oh, yeah, do no, not no. doubt that. Come anyway, to Colorado. We will. I was All just right. there. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Ross. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.